You're listening to Why We Do What We Do. Welcome to Why We Do What We Do. I am your wiggly-eyed host, Abraham. (laughs) <laughs> and I'm your wavering line of sight host, Shane. We're a psychology podcast. We talk all the things about psychology and the stuff that we do as humans and, and other things, frankly. And today we are tackling a subject that I'm hoping does not land us in a lot of hot water because we're, we're, it's somewhat controversial what we're doing today. I also love that like we just never know. What's going to get us in hot water? Yeah. We've done episodes where we're like, this is going to cause a problem and not hurt a peep from anybody. Yeah. And then we've done some where we're like, that's the thing that you're going to hang up on. Right. Like people are really mad about hypnosis. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that was one that we got a lot of contact about. So anyway, we are doing EMDR and uh, it's a thing that's actually got a lot of popularity. I think people seem to be really into it, but uh, we're going to try to unpack it a little bit. Yeah. Okay, so this episode is going to be released on November 16th, and there's a few holidays we're going to recognize just for fun because we can. If you're listening to this on the day that it is published, you might go out and celebrate that it is National Fast Food Day. Yes. Many of the chains would like you to know. It is also (laughs) National Button Day, which is kind of fun. Buttons are cool. We've also got Clarinet Day, you know, giving some spotlight to the woodwinds. That's right. (laughs) (laughs) Um, it is the International Day of Tolerance, so this is, you know... Love that. Yeah, absolutely. I'm bored with that. And uh, National Education Support Professionals Day. It's a long one. Yeah. I also like the... Uh, it's a Human Animal Relationships Day. It's actually Human Animal Relationships Awareness Week, a whole week for it. Oh, ooh, even yeah. better. Like, I, I support that because uh, I have animals and I enjoy them. Now, to be clear, this Very is so. more of a... Not a romantic relationship, we'll say. Well, yeah, that's fair. Just to be clear, hey, hey, listen, people people interpret things. <laughs> that It's a very good point. There's a few that are for the month of November that I don't know if we've stated in the past. We stated a few, but it is National Adoption Month. That's a good month. People adopting. Yeah, that's great. And then another one I really like here is National Native American Heritage Month. Celebrate I like that Native even American. more. Yeah, it was really good. And I'll just throw in one more. There's a couple more that we'll do next time. But the last one I'll throw in is it is Manatee Awareness Month. Hey, I love that one. That yeah. one is great. I live in a state where manatees are all over the place. Yeah. So uh, it's nice. They're, they're It's wild to see them in real life. Yeah. The, uh, the mermaids of the sea. They're huge. Yeah. Yeah. Very, very large. They're very large. Anyway, we're going to talk about EMDR, I promise. Uh, or maybe we haven't even introduced that. That's what we're talking about today. Yeah. If you end up liking today's episode and you are not already a subscriber, then you should consider subscribing. You can also support us in other ways like becoming a Patreon member, picking up some merch, repainting the addresses for our houses on our curb, <laughs> or you know all the, all the things. I'll talk more about all those at the end of this episode. Yeah. Okay. Shane, let's get into our topic. Yes, let's talk about this. What is eye movement desensitization and reprocessing, or EMDR? Uh, Where did it all start? What was its basis for development? That's what we're going to kind of explore today. It was developed in the late 1980s as a way to address symptoms of PTSD, or post-traumatic stress disorder. Yes. So it's, it's relatively recent as far as therapies go. And so let's talk, let's talk about someone. We're going to talk about Mike. Yeah, we all know Mike. Yeah, it's Mike. Every, you know, everyone's friend Mike. He was a 32-year-old flight medic who served two tours in Iraq. Mike was experiencing some PTSD. There was some unprocessed, one might say, memories, basically dealing with some traumatic events. For Mike, this was a, a mass casualty event or an MCE, along with 10 other distressing combat-related experiences. And then when his father told Mike that he would become the man of the house upon their parents' divorce, this carried a strong emotional charge and triggered some symptoms of PTSD for Mike. Yeah, and this contrasted with appropriately processed memories and even traumatic ones that can be brought about with the same level of emotional charge. So, like, basically, he's having these really salient, intense experiences related to these kind of, like, what would be standard life events? Hey, things are going to happen, you're going to deal with it, but these became really significant triggers for him. So, the MCEs, specifically, that we're referencing here, are or these mass casualty events, were rated as a 10 out of 10 on the subjective units of disturbance scale, 10 being the worst. So, so Mike is experienced some really horrible things, actually. Yeah, so during this MCE, there was an attempt to rescue several soldiers who had been injured when an improvised explosive device, also called an IED, probably more commonly called an IED, Mm -hmm. was struck by their vehicle, the Hummer that they were driving, 
And so then there was that explosion that he experienced there. Yeah. And so as a result of that, he was referred for EMDR after being discharged from the army with PTSD. That event caused that. And that's actually pretty common for folks who have seen combat and seen these types of things. PTSD is a pretty common diagnosis. Yeah. And so let's go ahead and let's really get into what EMDR is. As we'll see, PTSD is the place where it has most commonly been applied, although it's been applied widely beyond that. But as we said, EMDR sounds like electro music dance revolution, mm-hmm. but it's not yes. that. It is eye nope. movement desensitization and reprocessing. I have to say that a couple of times just so that it sticks because it's kind of a mouthful. Yeah. So it's described by the APA as, quote, a structured therapy that encourages the patient to briefly focus on a traumatic memory while simultaneously experiencing bilateral stimulation, typically eye movements, which is associated with a reduction in the vividness and emotion associated with the traumatic memory, end quote. That's sort of a description of what this is and how it's being applied. Yeah. And so as part of this kind of intervention, we'll say it doesn't require ongoing discussion of the trauma itself, but rather on the results of the trauma, like the emotions and thoughts and things like that. So, for example, we wouldn't discuss the actual traumatic event of witnessing the death of a family member, like when it happened, what was occurring in the environment at the time, what the death actually looked like, how the deceased looked. Instead, what we would focus on or emphasize are the effects of that traumatic event and those effects or what is processed during the EMDR session. So where they're processing negative thoughts, internal sensations like a change in heart rate or tingling under the arms. So, so they're not going over and going, this was the event that happened. Let's relive that event. They're going, this event happened to you. What have you experienced as a result of that event? I think that gives us a really good sort of introduction to what we're talking about. Now, I think there's an important piece here in understanding the history of the the development of the idea of EMDR. So this was originally developed in 1989 by someone named Francine Shapiro. This, she was a California-based psychologist, and essentially it was happening. She was walking through a park. She, at the time, was experiencing some, experiencing some negative thoughts and feelings. And as she was walking, she was sort of looking around at her surroundings looking right and left and noticing all the things around her. And she started to notice that those negative thoughts and feelings started to go away. They're sort of drifting away from her. She was finding some peace and relaxation and calm. And she essentially felt that her eye movements were the thing responsible for her feeling better. And that was it from this experience. EMDR is born. And so it's important to note that this wasn't, a therapy that emerged out of something like basic research. It didn't emerge out of some empirical precedent. It didn't even emerge out of some existing philosophy that would suggest that this would be an effective thing. It was just walking through a park, started to feel better, must be my eyes. Yeah. Was essentially the the logic that that sort of followed. So some other considerations, someone who's maybe skeptical might ask is, could it be the fact that you're outside walking in a nice park? (laughs) <laughs> Could it be the fact that you're getting some exercise, which has been shown time and time again to support like mental well-being? And we've done episodes on this. Sure. Could it be the acid that she was tripping on when she was walking through the park? <laughs> totally <laughs> kidding about the last one. <laughs> yeah. Or I guess this was the 80s. So the cocaine that she was on. Anyway, the, the last part's obviously a joke, but just some <laughs> considerations there. You know, incidentally, this is not how most legitimate scientific enterprises begin, but it is how several pseudosciences begin. Now, I think it's worth saying that, like, maybe as you're having an experience, you might ask a question and then go and look at the literature about that phenomenon. Like, you might try to do that, right? Like, you're not just going to kind of jump in and go, well, this worked, so we're going to develop something based on this thing. So kind of the idea is... The experience that Shapiro had was really good for generating a hypothesis, but not good for generating uh, or testing a hypothesis. Right. So it generates a question, but doesn't generate a result. And we are not, that's not really what we're looking for here. We talk about confirmation bias and all that stuff kind of go like, well, this was my experience, so it must work. That becomes kind of a problem. So was it just her though, or did others have similar experiences? And she decided to do some science and actually figure it out. So at least she did try to go do some science as a result, maybe. Yeah, there, there was an attempt toward research, which we'll go ahead and unpack, that happened as a result of this. EMDR found some overlap with this idea of adaptive information processing, or AIP. Okay, And so this adaptive information processing considers symptoms of PTSD and other sort of non-physically, non-chemically based disorders to result from past disturbances or experiences that continue to cause and elicit some kind of distress 
And the part of the hypothesis or the theory in this is that the memory was not adequately processed. I mean, we could go into what that could possibly mean. I honestly think we could have an entire episode length discussion on what adequately processed might mean with respect to memories. But for now, sure. we'll leave it at that's the the working fuzzy mechanism that's part of this, we'll say. Yeah, and these memories contain emotions, they contain thoughts, they contain all kinds of different things that occurred at the time of the traumatic event. So when you're starting to kind of look at that, you are kind of unpacking all of these experiences that you have or continue to have had about that particular event. Okay, so part of the original thought going into this and how this applied to PTSD was that the treatment effects that would result from EMDR were primarily reducing fear and anxiety related to the trauma that one experienced. But sure. currently, that it's kind of moved away from that. Instead, it's now that they're, they're looking at reduction in anxiety and fear are seen as byproducts of the processing of the event, not that they're actually reducing those, that it's processing the event and as an outcome of processing the event is a reduction in, in the experience of fear and anxiety around that event. So right. it's, it's sort of the cause effect has flipped positions a little bit. Right. It's, it's not the goal, but it's a cool benefit is essentially what they're saying. Right. Yeah. Like it's a cool side effect. So this type of therapy or treatment has been endorsed by the American psychological association or the APA for short, like we know uh, the U S department of veterans affairs, the U S department of defense and the world health organization, among many others for the treatment of PTSD. It's also used for anxiety, depression and eating and personality disorders. So they've kind of, done this thing that you see in psychology a lot where an intervention is developed and they go, okay, let's cast a wide net and see if it works for these other things that are a right. problem, which I think is good. Generalization is good. Yeah. It's nice to see that psychology is trying to do that at least. Yeah. I think our, there, there's sort of two sides to this. Cause on the one hand, I think we would say, yeah, we want to see where as broadly as possible where this applies. So like looking at, for example, something like medical marijuana, what kinds of things could that possibly be helpful for? We should explore as many things as we can and figure out what the parameters of effectiveness are for this thing. Sure. I think that makes sure. sense. On the other hand, it is like a very common tactic of other pseudosciences to be like the snake oil here. It's going to help your headaches, your eye pain, your leg pain, your financial woes, your menstrual cycle, your cramps, your weight, your like whatever, whatever you need. Honestly, you got a toothache, take some more, some more snake oil. And like that. Right. That sort of shotgun approach is also endemic to the the pseudosciences out there. So I think that the fact that it has been applied broadly or attempted to be have been applied broadly is not an indicator that this is a pseudoscience and a characteristic feature of pseudoscience is that thing, if that makes sense. So basically I'm saying yeah. that is not an outright like red flag, but it is one to sort of check, checkered, well, not a checkered flag, yellow, uh, flag? yellow flag. Yeah. Yellow flag. Yeah. Like keep your, keep your eye on it because that does, that does also correlate with other things that are not so strongly yeah. represented. Yeah. I think a, a checkered flag is more so like getting ready for a ska show. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Says the like you wave that when real big fish is coming on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's that's my understanding of a checkered flag. The, yeah, it's like I, real big fish is coming on, so it's like you wave that flag. Yeah, yeah, couldn't have anything to do with a car, a car race, but but probably a ska nah. band. That's where most people are going to associate it. I think. Yeah, yeah, it it, it signals that the there's a, a sale at Vans for checkered slip-ons. <laughs> My, the mighty mighty boss tones are about to headline <laughs> checkered flag yeah, you're, wave. You're, yeah, you hear someday, I suppose you hear. <laughs> Why yeah, we do great. what we do now with mouth trumpet. <laughs> <laughs> it's, that's the best thing to do. I love it. I love it. <laughs> so before before we get into kind of the phases of EMD, I think it's worth you. What you should all do is take a second. There's going to be ads. Skip the ads. Go listen to Real Big Fish or Less Than Jake or Mighty Buddy Boston's. And then we'll come back and talk about the eight phases. We'll pick it up there. Whoops, we said skip the ads and, <laughs> and just, just lost all of our advertisers. Just kidding, just kidding. Yeah, just so kidding. let's talk about these eight phases. These eight phases are kind of what is supposed to happen in the EMDR 
treatment kind of setting or like kind of the process. You've got uh, history taking, preparing the client, assessing the target memory, processing the memory to adaptive resolution. And that's for uh, phases four through seven. And then the last phase is evaluating the treatment results. And so we're going to talk a little bit through each one of these phases and what it entails and what the therapist is is likely doing during these these times. Okay. So the history and treatment plan phase one. So this is just gathering information about the traumatic event and the trauma and just in general. And then identifying potential targets for intervention and the sequence of those targets. Sounds pretty good. The second phase is preparation. So what ends up happening is there's some education and learning about EMDR strategies. You're learning coping skills to use when those difficult emotions arise. So there's a little bit of like priming and practice before you start actually doing the interventions. Phase three is assessment. This is before processing the event. You want to identify the emotions, beliefs, negative sensations, and somatic sensations that are associated with this memory. And now we get into the effect part, I guess. Yeah. So then phase four is the desensitization part. And that's when they start using bilateral visual stimulation, moving your eyes back and forth. It's specifically, that's what's happening. Like the bilateral visual stimulation happens with the eye movement. Yeah, they, they, they call it that because it sounds very official. What you're functionally doing is looking left and then right and then repeat repeat that step for a long time. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And then while you're doing that, while you're thinking about the target or what of the intervention until emotional reactivity reaches a level one or zero. All right. Phase five is installation. And that's where you hire a worker to come over and put in your new plumbing. Just kidding. Mm -hmm. That's where you get all the drywall. That's where you get the drywall. That's where you get the drywall to compartmentalize so you can just avoid the trauma. Oh, what a good metaphor. Okay. (laughs) So the idea here is to strengthen the positive cognition and emotions that will then replace the negative or aversive cognition and emotions. Now, phase six is the body scan. And essentially what happens here is that you assess for residual or leftover somatic symptoms and process them out. So basically you're kind of like looking and scanning to go, oh, am I still feeling this emotion? Am I still feeling this? Like if this physical response, am I still feeling these things? I'm going to process why I'm still feeling that and kind of try to move those out and, and, and replace them with something if I can. Yeah. Phase seven, the closing argument of the adaptive resolution section of this is uh, debriefing and closure. And this is a return to baseline. Start by using relaxation techniques and then reviewing coping strategies and practicing self-care. And then that's the sort of final step of that adaptive resolution, which was phases four through seven. Yeah, it's uh, essentially like you're coming in at the end of the roller coaster. There you go. I like that. Phase eight is reevaluation. So what you end up doing here is you recheck ratings and recheck experiences at a later time, not not at the end of the session. You do it later, potentially before the next session to review progress, identify possible new targets. Phase eight is almost like a return to phase three. Like you reassess and then you kind of like move through the process again through steps four through seven. Perfect. Okay, so. Let's talk about some other relevant information about this with respect to some of the research that's actually been done. So we sort of now unpacked, I think, the sort of structure of this, the origin of this. Let's dig into the science, if you will, of this. So essentially, again, sort of the underlying philosophy that emerged after the MDR was this idea that eye movements are thought to reduce the emotional charge of traumatic events, allowing safe thinking and reduction and the power of relevant triggers associated with those traumatic events. Yeah. And so essentially part of the the underlying assumption is that reprocessing helps repair the mental injury caused by the trauma and bilateral stimulation bypasses the area of the brain that has become stuck in that trauma due to the trauma or that PTSD. So, so essentially you're trying to almost like move around this thing, this blockage, and that's preventing the left hemisphere from healing the right hemisphere. So that's, I think kind of a, an interesting assumption is like, cause your brain is obviously split in half, yeah. right. Uh, or kind of, kind of, they say, yeah. So essentially this block is preventing one side from healing the other. And that's what this is trying to undo or unstuck. Right. And, and to be clear, We are not advocating that we believe that all of this is really good science around the explanation given, but this is part of the working hypothesis needed to drive continued use of this is to frame it in such a way that it sounds very sciencey and legitimate by using neurobabble, Mm -hmm. just as a food for thought. Yeah. The whole process here actually does, it involves a lot from exposure therapy or systematic desensitization therapy. That's also used for facilitating processing of traumatic events. And there are some arguments as to whether the bilateral stimulation is actually necessary for this. 
and that the desensitization techniques are actually effective completely all by themselves. Yeah. Now, in a 2013 meta-analysis, they noted that eye movements possibly do matter, but we'll talk about that when we get to the 2019 meta-analysis. So, huge thank you to Patrick who put these notes together, and Patrick included an anecdote talking with Joe Lang many years ago, where Joe Lang said, in ACT, uh, or Acceptance Commitment Therapy, the commitment part might only be necess- the, the only necessary component. You might not actually need the acceptance component, but the commitment component is the more necessary thing. And that kind of shows the complexity of psychotherapies and kind of languaging around this stuff and how we kind of focus or attend to different phenomenon, like covert phenomenon in our bodies. Yeah, and we'll, we'll talk a bit more about the sort of theoretical underpinnings of that everything but the kitchen sink or with the kitchen sink type of approach yeah. here in a moment. But we'd mentioned this 2019 meta-analysis for mental health problems by, we looked this up and it looks like it's maybe <laughs> pronounced quidgepers or quipas. Quipas. <laughs> it seems like the pronunciation guide we found said the author's name would be pronounced Coopers. So uh-huh. just there's a J in the middle of that vowel sound there. Yeah. It's spelled C-U-I-J-P-E-R-S. Correct. So yeah. yeah. So Coopers is what we're going with because it's easy to say. Yeah. And, and the guide told us to say it that way. Yeah. Right. Like, yeah. We literally checked that out. So, yeah. yeah. All right. Now, uh, in this meta analysis, the authors analyzed 77 trials, 62% of which were focused on PTSD, 17 trials on anxiety, three on depression, and nine, quote unquote, other mental health. Yeah. That's fun. Within this study, the primarily research mechanism suggested either A, an orienting response where the eye movements activate a reflex that results in an alert response. When there is no threat observed, a sense of relaxation is produced, which inhibits negative effects associated with the memory. So essentially what they're saying is I'm doing this thing. It triggers some other genetic response in me and it makes it so that I can't experience those negative effects or B is that the working memory has a limited capacity. So the focus on the eye movement blurs the vividness of the memory and the less vivid memory is what gets placed in the long-term memory, which I, I, I have a hard time buying that because yeah. the trauma probably already exists in the long-term memory because I'm still dealing with it many, many years later. So it's probably yeah. already there. Yeah. That, that one seems a little hard to swallow in my mind. Yeah, I feel like I feel like maybe what they're trying to say is that it maybe it replaces the memory, but I feel like like almost like you're reframing the memory, but I don't really it doesn't really I don't really buy it. Yeah, yeah, there's so much metaphor wrapped around this. It, to me cuz cuz I kind of read it as like distorting the memory such that it no longer could be remembered in the same way, but that's not really how memories work. I mean, when we when we recall anything, we're we're manipulating that memory and so we, uh, things how we remember them get sort of shaped and twisted over time. Every sure. time we, we reaccess it, we change it a little bit, but calling it blurry is, as I think a little bit of a misdirect there. Right. Also, also a bad puddle of mud song, <laughs> you know, too many puddle of mud songs. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> Very few of these studies actually were able to effectively sort of rule out the bias that may have been in place during those studies. It does seem like there was maybe an effect as this being effective for a treatment for anxiety, but it was too small of an effect size to really make any conclusions to state that that would actually be a recommended application of this. And so Mm -hmm. it was kind of inconclusive, more or less, for mental health because there was so much risk of bias in, in these studies. Now, the other part of this is that this 2019 meta-analysis was unable to confirm the results of the 2013 meta-analysis. So we run this issue of, can we reproduce these effects? And that's going to bring us to a little bit about the this 2022 meta-analysis by Hoogstetter. Yeah, that looks right. From 2022. This is the most recent study that we've got here. Although, I mean, if it's Gaelic, it's probably pronounced Jackson. I guess. <laughs> yeah. Or Sean. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Sean. Uh, Siobhan. <laughs> Siobhan. I mean, <laughs> yeah. Hoops uh, so essentially asking the question, is EMDR effective in reducing trauma symptoms and externalizing behavior problems with adolescents? There was a large overall effect. Cohen's D.909 as an outcome of this one. Yeah. Which I 
from a statistics standpoint, I can tell you I don't know what that means. <laughs> right. Statistically speaking, I don't know if that matters. <laughs> Most things and stats, though, are like this is on a scale of zero to one. The closer you get to one, the more powerful of an effect you have. I'm, I'm assuming sure. that that's the case here. I'm, I'm not uh, I'm not sure. Yeah. If that's the case, then Cohen's D looks good. <laughs> <laughs> now we could go down a rabbit hole on the certification and credentialing around the use of emdr but instead we're going to go on a rabbit hole of advertisers okay but we do actually have something to say about certification and uh, emdr uh, the EMDRIA, which is the EMDR International Association. So, EMDRIA mm. is how oh, I'm assuming that sounds, that's, yeah. how that's pronounced. It also sounds like a prog metal band. It does. I was having a very similar thought. I was like, this I definitely see is like math rock going on here. Yeah, yeah. EMDRIA is EMDRIA's opening up for Candiria on this next tour. <laughs> so, out of uh, New Hampshire. Yeah, wherever they're from. Now, this certification, this essentially says that that a person can practice once trained. Certification is not required, but voluntary, which is, uh, that's a thing. And as long as you are licensed as a mental health professional, you can practice it. And that's, and that's to happen sometimes. Like, not every licensed mental health practitioner is certified in every single intervention that they do. Totally, yeah. And so in the training program, you're going to get instruction in the current explanatory model, whatever that happens to be. The methodology and the underlying mechanisms or hypothesized mechanisms of EMDR, and this is done through lecture, practice, and then integrated consultation, not unlike other common sort of mental health applications. Right. And it sounds like you have to be licensed as a mental health professional, and you have to have a notarized statement of practice, which essentially says, do you have at least two years of experience in your field of license, which is the standard, apparently, for psychology? This is like every every psychology profession is two years? Two years. Oh, do you have two years? Yeah. Two years. Secret. Two years. That is the... It's, it's a secret. That is the number. And then you also have to have conducted at least 50 EMDR sessions with at least 25 clients. So again, two per client. Secret number is two. Yeah. That's it. That's it. That's if we're going to do number psychology there, there you go. (laughs) I think there's a requirement of 20 hours of consultation from an EMDR consultant. The intended purpose of this consultation is for the consultant to provide guidance and feedback to the consultee, the person in training regarding their use of standard EMDR therapy with clients. Now, a point that we want to make here is that consultation is not supervision. Okay, a consult team maintains full responsibility and autonomy for the decisions involved in their client's treatment. The consultant provides feedback on the consultee's implementation of standard EMDR therapy and is not directive with client treatment. So essentially what is happening here is that consult is a part of the process, but the consultee doesn't have to do anything with it. Yeah, they can just sit there for they can do the Michael Scott HR thing where they can just sit with Toby and do nothing. Yeah. And document that they got 20 hours. Yeah, that that is a bit of a red flag. The supervision piece is so important. So agreed a little little concerning there. So essentially, the consultant's primary responsibility is to evaluate the consultees, the trainee, their ability to implement the standard EMDR therapy in that eight phase protocol that we described earlier in a three-pronged approach. So the consultee should also demonstrate an awareness of situations in which the modifications to standard EMDR therapy and practice is necessary to safely and effectively provide treatment to a client. I feel like that part, the skills that go along with evaluating and modifying based on client individuality, that's necessary. That's like a kind of a standard practice for the field, too. Sure. Yeah, I think I'm on board with that. Now, if there are concerns about the consultee's ability, the consultant is responsible for communicating those concerns as early as possible during the consultation process so that appropriate corrective measures can be taken by the consultee. Again, the thing that comes that this comes down to is this is recommended. This yeah. is this is not going to be a thing that they're they're not supervising. They're saying, "Hey, you should probably do this better. Here's my notes on this." Yeah. And that can lead to, I mean, a, maybe eventually this person getting certified in this, but maybe not. Yeah, and there is a letter of recommendation from the EMDR consultant that's required, two additional letters of recommendation. There's probably some bribery involved in, in some of that. Sure. And then certificates of completion for at least 12 CE or continuing education hours completed after the initial training. And I don't know if that's on like repeated, like it's like every two or three years you have to get that, or if it's just like get your 12 after you've been certified and then you're done for life. 
sort of thing. I would imagine it's recurring. Most CEs typically are. That's almost the definition of continuing education. Sure. But I'm just not clear on this here. Yeah, yeah, it's not it's not quite clear there. There are a couple of quick things to point out about some of this research that we just unpacked, which is that so Shapiro looked into herself oh, oh, doing the um, the eye movement without that sort of systematic desensitization piece. So it's like just eye movements. That's essentially what this is predicated on. Right. It's the eye right. movement piece is like how this got started. It's the under the underpinnings. That's the whole bilateral stimulation thing that they're talking about. So presumably if that is the critical component, then just doing that should have at least some effect. Right. Now she looked into doing this without the exposure part and saw no effect. Essentially you had to combine eye movement with an effective therapy. And alternatively, if you did a fixed gaze, meaning you took out the eye movement part and included only the exposure part, it did work. So again, huh. the eye movement part seems to be relatively unimportant you get essentially exposure therapy something that's established we know that it works evidence shows that it's an effective treatment for things like trauma and that sort of thing right and you can if you would like add on to that eye movement this brings us to a term that i learned called purple hat therapy yeah yes i saw this applied in a lot of different ways it was like if i teach you to read better while you're wearing a purple hat do you attribute the reading to the purple hat if I teach you like coping strategies for dealing with road rage and then give you a purple hat, do you then attribute the effect of your road rage to the purple hat? And what's funny about this is when I was looking up examples of purple hat therapy, I just Googled this. The first like five or 10 results said EMDR. <laughs> <laughs> That's wild. Yeah. And I wasn't, I, I didn't even put EMDR as part of my search. I wanted to just find some quick examples I could pull in. And I, so I just type in purple hat therapy and obviously there's my search history. I was, look, I was reading about this. So it's possible that's why, where it came from. But again, I didn't use that keyword. So I'd be curious to see if other people's have a similar outcome when they do this Google search. You know, we can test it right now. Let's test I have it. I've not searched Google EMDR. So let's see purple hat therapy. And uh, there's a purple hat society. Okay. <laughs> Let's see. Which I thought was interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Here we go. So EMDR is the third one down that's not advertised. Okay. There's a Twitter account on here um, that somebody's in vacation mode. And then uh, it goes purple hat therapy and chicken hypnosis. So I just want to be clear. A quick Google search would lump in EMDR and chicken hypnosis and induced after death communication. Okay. Just so you all have that information. And there is a bunch of EMDR articles on here too. Yeah. And it's not like a guilty by association, but just interesting to know that those things coexist in the same space together. Yeah. For what it's worth. Yeah. And another thing about some of the research that's been done that's helpful to know is that at the time that I'm aware of a recent research, meta-analysis looked at the empirical studies that have been done. And there have been in the 35 years that there's been research on this EMDR, fewer than 500 participants and all the studies. So for considering that I think all of these have been group design studies, that's a that's a pretty small n. That would be like a potentially acceptable n for one study. <laughs> right. But across all studies that that does speak to a an issue with the effect size and generality of these findings. 100%. And so part of the the overlap here is we talked about this exposure therapy, essentially what EMDR does, that's not exactly exposure therapy because the exposure therapy tends to entail uh, actually contacting, like physically being in the presence of the triggering event, imaginal exposure therapy, which can be part of that and often precedes the actual exposure therapy is essentially confronting it mentally It's walking through. I want you to imagine this triggering event and then sort of going through that practice such that you start to have desensitization to the mental experience of the triggering event. And so that that seems to be the sort of critical part of this that's uh, that's associated with the effectiveness. Yeah, I think that makes sense. I think it's reasonable. So let's take a second then to talk about some of the more behavioral processes of this, because as we as we all know, we tend to be behaviorally oriented. So it's worth kind of unpacking that. Now, yeah. the first part of this is it, it's said to be based on Pavlov's hypothesis that traumatic memories produce a pathological change in neural elements. So that gets into kind of like neurology and physiology and stuff. And this occurs due to an imbalance in the brain that is produced by traumatic memories. And we know this is true. Like we know that like traumatic events 
specifically like like childhood abuse actually shapes different structures of the brain produces like that's a there's there's an effect there or at least there's like that's a there's a strong hypothesis there i'll say it like that maybe we'll do an episode on that yeah but essentially what happens is this prevents the brain from coming to a resolution about information that is processing so saccadic movement or rapid movements of the eyes that abruptly change the point of fixation along with imagining imagining the traumatic memory are part of kind of what's going on here the saccadic movement but you have to kind of ask the question and unpack this what is an imbalance in the brain and that's kind of a difficult thing to discover or test or evaluate or even standardize it implies that there's such thing as balance and what that means and how you would know. I mean, if you take something as simple as if people listen to other podcasts, like one of the most popular podcasts in the world is radio lab, right? Sure. They just did. Essentially they interviewed an author who was doing something about, well, put it frankly, but, but they specifically talk about clothing uh, <laughs> and measurement. You know, it's, I'm so glad you said that because that came up on my feed the other day and it just said radio lab, butt stuff. Yeah. Butt stuff. Yep. <laughs> that's what that episode is called. So I guess that's a, a bonus recommend kind of. Yeah. Anyway, it's, it's fairly short, but the, the discussion that happened was actually one I've heard and from multiple capacities now is that there is many, many things that are designed to be around an average or an archetype of people. And so, for example, what was happening is there was like, uh, this is such a side tangent, but in a couple of different places that this has been applied is they took like an either ideal person and they fitted close to them and said, okay, this is that size. They want to shape everything around this person's body and ta- tailor all over close to this and just make them different sizes. And this person's size is the archetype. So for that person, clothes are going to fit great. But for no one else are they going to fit as well because everybody's body is different. That is also true of our of our behaviors, of our brains, of our minds, of mm-hmm. our experiences. They're all different. There's some that are going to have more overlap than others, but they're all uniquely different. So if you were to try and figure out what a balanced brain looks like, you'd be totally making it up from an average, which again represents nobody, or an archetype, which represents one body. And so right. the idea that you have, you could actually measure a balance and then determine whether something's imbalanced is kind of nonsense on its face. Way long of a tangent. But just to say, like, what that could possibly mean breaks down at the very idea of the word imbalance, let alone <laughs> that yeah. that's actually what's going on in the brain. Right. So there's a thing. So with the Pavlov thing, we're talking about respondent conditioning, and we talked about that quite a bit in our our deep dive on Pavlov in that episode. So you can go back and listen to that for a refresher. But essentially, the idea here is that this this reflexive conditioning is a means to describe trauma and a conditioned fear response, which makes actually a lot of sense in sort of thinking about unpacking this from a physiological, neurological behavior conditioning model. And with fear conditioning, we see this pairing with, you know, for example, a white rat or a white bunny, something white and fuzzy with a fear arousing noise, specifically if you look at the little Albert experiment. Right. And so you see this kind of happen where the familiar white features are generalized as a result of this experience, this stimulus. So you hear this loud noise, crashing noises, smashing, screaming, whatever it is, and it gets paired with that white feature. And then now it generalizes. And so that trauma has generalized these different situations. And uh, I believe it was with Miranda back in the day, we did a full blow by blow of that entire study with little Albert and follow up from as much as we could find about what happened to little Albert afterwards. So yeah, another one to reference. Yeah. And going back to the fear conditioning in humans, another common measure is skin conductance is, like, is what it sounds like basically. Yeah. And then heart rate and other things. And this shows a higher value in response to current condition stimulus than a previous conditioned stimulus, meaning that the previous one does not elicit as strong of a response. So you can override that response with a new pairing. Yeah. And now you'll see similar spikes in activity in the amygdala during fear conditioning in both rats and humans. And we see this in a number of fMRI studies. Go, that's another one too. If you want to know what that is, go look, look in our episode on uh, fMRIs. We're doing all the hits in this episode. Yeah, seriously. And the conceptualization of PTSD where multiple cues that, neutral thing that thing that didn't mean anything that that cue that did that was just kind of by itself before has now been conditioned what ends up happening is it becomes associated with that traumatic experience forming strong sensory memories or responses we because sometimes we can call this stimulus generalization or whatever but we see these physical responses related to these new learned relationships with these cues this could be considered a, another sort of checkered flag <laughs> sell out me tonight sell out Burp. 
for me, oh yeah. Okay, so we were talking about essentially how the respondent conditioning works in terms of both its, uh, developing a traumatic fear response as well as treating a traumatic fear response. Oftentimes, there are a lot of different cues involved. It's not just a memory. It's not just one single salient stimulus. It could be a lot of things. So during the explosion of that IED, there's a crowd of people, there's trash where the IED was placed. It could be the temperature. It could be the car that they were in. We were talking about this with our, our, our buddy Mike at the be beginning of the episode. All of these were stimuli that had very little effect in eliciting a trauma event, but then because they were all associated with that explosion, that trauma event, they all be then immediately became conditioned for the fear of that then response to those, those stimuli that now carry a brand new effect and a brand new function. Right. And so Pavlov reported the extinction of, the, of one would lead to the extinction of all. But when they try to replicate this, future studies did not actually support that. Essentially, they said that you might be able to extinguish one relation, but that, that you might still be able to carry that response to the other stimuli that were, are, were present during that. And so the, it's such a mishmash. You can't necessarily expect one stimulus unpairing to also unpair all the other stimulus pairings that occurred at the same time. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Now, another thing to unpack within this, too, is this idea of trauma-informed care. And this has been an increasing focus in behavior analytic work and, and behavior analytic treatments. And it does align with behavioral principles, kind of what we just talked about. So the definition of, quote, individual trauma results from an event or series of events or set of circumstances that is experienced by an individual as physically or emotionally harmful or life-threatening. And that has lasting adverse effects on the individual's functioning in mental, physical, social, emotional, or spiritual well-being. End quote. And that's from S A M H S A uh, from 2014. And so I think this is important to unpack because PTSD is inherently physical responses and emotional responses, but physical responses to stimulus events, stimulus events specifically. So trauma informed care focuses on understanding those things, understanding those triggers, understanding those responses, and trying to right. either avoid or undo those relationships in some meaningful way. And since we're just dropping episodes, we did an episode earlier this year with Sandra Bishop on trauma-informed care and behavior analysis. So another one to check out. Yep, exactly. So from the Centers Disease Control in 2019, they reported around 61% of adults have experienced at least one adverse childhood event. This could be abuse, neglect, domestic violence, exposure to substance abuse, divorce potentially etc. Mm -hmm. The effects of trauma can vary from having no trauma, or at least none reported, to intense PTSD. And everybody experiences those triggering events differently. For some, for one person, an event might turn into a PTSD relation to that event, where another person essentially moves past it with very little to report in terms of their experience with it. And that's just it's just an individualized thing that we can't necessarily predict who is going to respond to those things in what in what ways. Right. I think it's important, too, is like trauma is expressed differently among different people right. for different events. Two people could have the, the, a shared experience about a singular event, and they may have totally different responses right. depending on how they've interpreted it. Exactly. Now, oftentimes this is conceptualized as some kind of extrinsic event or is caused by some extrinsic event, like as with physical trauma. However, the effect of trauma is often far too complicated as an internal response to an adverse event with emphasis on how the individual feels and perceives the event. So the languaging around that, the feeling the emotions around that are very difficult to pin down and describe and, and really explain across the board. So which makes that difficult to align with EMDR, where the underlying reasons of effectiveness are not entirely clear or at best are hypothesized to include unobservable events. So essentially what EMDR is doing is they're looking at internal events that vary greatly among every individual that has had this experience, even with the same diagnosis, different languaging around that, because a lot of times people can only explain experiences with the language they have. So you kind of have this like very nebulous thing going on that's not really sh like it's very unclear of what part of it works if it works so sort of i think the summary of this section of this is that there's an opportunity for us to collaborate with people who are doing amdr because there's definitely some alignment with the idea of respondent classical conditioning that sort of thing and how that relates to our physiology and that 
and that we should be open to different conceptualizations that push us outside of our norm. And of course, always bringing with us a skeptical scientific lens, looking for empiricism, looking for dismantling any things where we have superfluous or unnecessary components so that we can proceed most with the most efficient, most effective part of treatment. Yeah, absolutely. 100%. We have a few other fun little pieces to include here as we as we start to wind down on this episode. So one of them is that when there are nightmares that that often are a part of a of the experience of post traumatic stress disorder, some have hypothesized that this is the brain's attempt to turn the perception of event into an actual memory of the event, essentially meaning that it takes the traumatic relation to it and makes that part of the event itself. And similarly, flashbacks are believed to be perceptions of the event, not the memory of the event. So again, sort of reliving or creating the experience of trauma rather than a actual like sort of visceral memory, if you will. Yeah. Now, another part of this is it, there's a possible relationship between active EMDR during periods of being awake and REM, rapid eye movement, during sleep phases. REM is thought to be where dreams primarily occur. So there's some interesting kind of discussions around, we'll say, whether or not active EMDR with the eye movement is similar to REM kind of experiences. One source we always like to turn to to look for essentially an aggregate source of sort of vetting data that has been done is the What Works Clearinghouse for Evidence-Based Practices evaluates science and pseudoscientific claims and looks at different research and that sort of thing. And there is a, a good amount of studies that do show improvements by including EMDR as part of the treatment. I think that we've unpacked that fairly well. Sure. The thing to consider around this is that logic about how it works is, is pretty scattered. There seems to be a very, there's not a lot of consistency and in, in sort of identifying the underlying responsible mechanisms for this works if it works. Okay. Another, as we mentioned, is the sample sizes are pretty small, which makes it really difficult to calculate really strong effects, whether or not they're there. There is enormous amount of subjectivity in the rating changes of thoughts, which means that there's usually low test retest reliability and very little validity that's being done. There's a lack of follow up on the effects. And there's really, and one of the most critical parts of this, there's minimal verification of the independent variable, meaning the EMDR. There's very little verification of fidelity with that implementation. So essentially saying, like, we can't be sure this is being implemented consistently enough to measure whether, whether there's an effect. The effect that we're measuring is subjective at best a lot of the time. There is very little follow-up, and we don't know how it works if it works. Yeah. And so all of that, those are, again, red or yellow flags <laughs> yeah. about yeah, yeah. what we're seeing here. Then this brings us to the question of pseudoscience and whether or not EMDR is a pseudoscience. And what we can kind of say or unpack here is that there are increases in trauma-based interventions like exposure and response prevention, like in vivo exposure, in social skills training, coping skills training. There is that kind of stuff. And there is a discussion to be had around this idea of breakthrough therapies. But what ends up happening is, is with EMDR, it seems like the implementation and the intervention is far ahead of the actual evidence to support it. And the other kind of thing to unpack within that is that there is maybe there are extra components or like there's extra fat on this that we can carve away. Like yeah. you don't maybe need the eye movement, but you do need the exposure and the verbal behavior around this, but you don't necessarily need the eye movement part of it. What ends up happening here and what we see with EMDR is there's a the use of scientific language. There's use of assessment. There's use of those types of things that sound really, really sciencey, but it actually disguises pseudoscience as science. I'm not necessarily saying that's what's happening here with EMDR, because it sounds like there could be some helpful effects. What we are saying, though, is at least there's not enough evidence to support its the, the amount of use that we're seeing with it, I guess. I love that. And I actually think that's exactly where I would also land on this as, as a primary take home is like maybe there's something here. But the thing is, when we really try to unpack this, we're, we're kind of left wanting because there's so there's there's not very much substance. So we we if you look for example, you teach someone coping strategies, which is a lot of what sort of happens in some of these EMDR sessions, and you do EMDR. At what part of that was the effective part? 
And it seems like when you teach the coping strategies without EMDR, it works. And if you teach EMDR without the coping strategies, it doesn't. There's the quote that I've used now a couple of times that is the what's unique about EMDR doesn't work and what works about EMDR isn't unique. Yeah. But that again, it does seem like maybe there's something here, but we don't know what it is and and how it works or if it works or if we're just sort of chasing ghosts of an effect, you know, because there are other elements. And and a huge part of therapy that I th- I feel like we've maybe discussed in the past but is worth reiterating is that an enormous part of an of an effective therapy is the therapeutic relationship. Maybe that's another component of this. It's like you have you have the experience of EMDR of someone who's hardcore validating your feelings. Right. That is maybe the part that's maybe missing from other versions of exposure therapy that's present in EMDR, or maybe it's the EMDR, you know? So right. when we've looked at the research, EMDR is better than nothing. <laughs> when you have right. no, no effect, it's better than essentially talking to someone who's not actually responding to you, who's just sort of listening and not saying anything. But it, it's not really better than other therapies that are trying to do the same thing. Right. Those therapies tend to perform at least as well, if not better. And so that's, that's sort of where I find myself on this. Yeah. And I think I would land there too. I think that the purple hat metaphor, yeah. you know, really makes sense here. You yeah. know, it's like you're adding, you're adding extra, you're gilding the lily as far as the stuff goes, right? Like nice. you don't need to add more to this if there's already parts of it that work, right? Like it's just flourish, it's fancy, it's it's additional stuff that's really not necessary to see the effect that you need to see. Word. Well, I hope that we didn't ruin anyone's day. Likewise. I hope you have a really good day. <laughs> Likewise. But I think that's what we have to say about EMDR. Do you have anything to add? No, I got nothing that, I got nothing else to add here. Well, maybe we can recommend some things. I can do that. recommendations all right so i'm going to recommend a book as one as i am want to do um and i would i think this is i I would be hard pressed to call this a book as opposed to like maybe um like it's a manual it's huge and that is it by stephen king have you ever read this i never have i've always wanted to but i look at the size of the spine which occupies the space of several novels put together (laughs) and and then i i worry i'm like do i have like three years to commit to this book so I've, re- I, I, it's been a couple of months since I started it, like, which okay. is a long time for me. Yeah. For you, that's very long. Yeah. It's very long. So I will say this. My only problem with it is that it's very difficult to hold because I can't hold it like a book. Oh, I've got to hold it like a, like a phone book because like a it is huge. It's, it's yeah, exactly. It's almost 1200 pages. Okay. I've read, I've read longer books than that. So I, I have no excuse. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it, but it's still, you're kind of like, this is uh, uncomfortable to hold. But what I would say is, is that does it have its concerns? Yes. Uh, this is Stephen King writing, writing at his best, uh, truly writing at his best. But yes, there are parts of it. You're like, did he need to do that? Or did he need to say that? And I think that's like part of the charm of Stephen King is that he can kind of get it. Like he like does that. And you're like, he's kind of unfiltered. Right. This actually feels very in keeping with uh, with my experience of Stephen King. Yeah, absolutely. Is that he it does not feel like an editor was heavy handed in shaping his writing process. It really feels like he was able to get most of his ideas on the page. And aside from copy editing, it made it to publication. Yeah. Which is not an indictment. Like, I think that's actually a charming thing about Stephen King that I like all about a lot of yeah. his writing. And this is just a re- it's a really well done novel. I mean, I, my wife was telling me last night, she, you know, I was reading it. And she's like, oh, look, you're almost done. And I was like, there are like 200 pages. There's another whole book that I've got to read in this. <laughs> there's one more like, book it, it, there's a whole there's one more <laughs> book in this like 15 book book, you know. But anyway, it's beautifully written. It captures like kind of the innocence of being kids and kind of the adventure that kids go through and, and all that. And I and I do recommend it as a read if you are interested in stephen king if you like the movie i mean they do a good job with this like i mean it's it's definitely worth the read i love it chapter one which i know it's yeah. just called it but that that movie i thought was really good yeah and I, honestly they nail it if you like the movie the book nails that awesome yeah okay i'm going to recommend a game as i am wants to do <laughs> yeah i love it this is a sort of this is a board game. It's a tabletop game. It's largely a card game, but it's a relatively sort of simple puzzly game called Verdant. This is a brand new game from Flat Out Games as the publisher. Also, I think co-published by a, a board game publishing company called AEG. 
and it's a board game about house plants. <laughs> if, if you can, it's not boring though. I mean, it, it sounds like it would be, but essentially you get to place cards that represent rooms, and next to those rooms you place house plants, and the rooms have different lighting conditions that the house plants like. Functionally, it's it's like a logical puzzle. Basically, you want to try and fit sure. as many things that work together as you can in like a grid of cards that you're playing in front of you. It has a lot of room for strategy, but it's not very complicated. It's a fairly like there's two things that you do maybe on your turn. Sure. And that's pretty much it. And then you just go until you've had the number of requisite terms. I like that. Anyway, it's a cute little game. I think uh, people will enjoy it. So that's my recommendation. I'm, I'm here for that. I, I, I fully support that. Awesome. Well, this has been a long one. Let's go ahead and let everyone take off. Enjoy the rest of their Wednesday or Thursday or whatever day that you're listening to this on. Before I let you go, I'd like to remind you that if you would like to support us, you should subscribe. Make sure you catch every episode. Tell a friend about us. You can join us on Patreon. And if you do, you get some bonus content. There's a video of us recording. You get some behind the scenes content. You can see our notes, which sometimes have pictures, comments, and other little fun quips and a lot of stuff that we decide to cut out and that aren't don't make it to the final product and all kinds of things. And that always really helps us out. But if you don't want to do that, but you would like to maybe throw a little coin our way, you can pick up some stickers or some beanies or sweaters or shirts or coffee mugs or water bottles or patch, whatever. We got tons of stuff in our merch store. Sure. You can find all of that at our website, www.podcast.com. Um, if you would like to tell us about a board game or a book you're really into, or if you have some thoughts or experiences with EMDR you would like to share, maybe correct us on something that we said, or you can say, nope, you nailed it. Great job. You can email us at info at www.podcast.com. You can find us on pretty much any social media platform where there are not alt-right racists to just run the place. Yeah. If that's not the case, then you will probably be there. But if that is the case, you probably won't find us there. Yeah. And so that largely means like Facebook and Instagram and something else probably yeah mostly those <laughs> mostly those that's where we're hanging out these days maybe one day we'll also be cool enough to be on tiktok but as we get older i think that becomes less and less a possibility i don't know kevin bacon was on there so i think that we're okay okay that's fair he's definitely older than we are okay that's yeah. good to know danny elfman is on there so i think that's he's he's way up there now that's true for those people who have already joined us on Patreon, I'd like to say thank you to Amanda, Brad, The Daily BA, Joshua, Justin, Justine, Kelly, Kim, Kostia, Layla, Megan, Mike, M, Mike, T, Shauna, and Stephanie. Thank you all so much for your continued support. And then thank you so much for my wonderful team, without whom I could not do this podcast. And that includes Justin, Alan, Jess, Patrick, and of course, Shane. Thank you for recording with me today. Of course, anytime. And as we said, special shout out to Patrick for putting together the notes and helping us with this discussion and episode today. Yes. Am I forgetting anything? Do you have anything else to add? No, I got nothing else. All right. Thank you all so much for listening. This is Abraham. And this is Shane. We're out. See ya. You've been listening to Why We Do What We Do. You can learn more about this and other episodes by going to www.podcast.com. Thanks for listening. And we hope you have an awesome day.